Good morning, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us, depending on what time zone you're in. We're so happy to have you here at our um, co-piece discussion on impact investing using creative solutions. We are very thrilled and honored to have our special guest, Clark Kellogg, join us uh, today for our, our conversation. Um, I see some familiar faces and I see some brand new faces. So I wanna welcome those of you that are new to the co-piece community and hope uh, you find this intriguing. I hope you find this helpful and practical for your life today. Um, just a couple housekeeping pieces. Um, just asking everyone to keep yourself on mute and we will be taking questions and answers um, at about half past the hour. So feel free to please send uh, chat questions, or I'm sorry, questions directly to me through the chat, and then I will help facilitate that at the end of the conversation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Craig Jonas. First of all, I didn't even introduce myself. I apologize. My name's Meg Nastin. I'm the Chief Relationship Officer here at CoPeace. Um, excited about this great team of people that we have here today. I'm going to turn it over to our founder and CEO, Craig Jonas. So go ahead, Craig. Thank you, Meg, and uh, really appreciate everybody being here, and very excited to have uh, Clark Kellogg in the mix, a uh, special person. In fact, his uh, nickname was Special K, I think, when he was playing. So, uh, uh, very honored to have Clark in the in in today. We we're going to go through a couple things on the impact investing side, some updates uh, from the Copi side, and then uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, Clark's background and his uh, his fits in the kind of the creative uh, bent that we have here at Copi and his uh, kind of compassion for fellow fellow beings. Um, uh, quickly, we're going to do a quick update around the horn, and then we're going to go into uh, uh, some time with uh, Mr. Kellogg. So I'll turn it over to Ed. Thanks, Craig, and welcome, everyone. It's great to see a nice group here uh, assembled today. As many of you know, Copies is a uh, holding company that invests in companies that have positive uh, environmental and social impact in what they do. And what we're also doing, uh, which is an important update uh, for many of you, is, is that we also um, are of service to companies that want to have positive environmental and social impact. And through that, we've uh, launched a couple of wholly owned subsidiaries, Copies Finance and Copies Marketing, which provide services to companies uh, that are looking to fill the gaps during this difficult economic time uh, many companies have had to either let folks go or are constrained by uh, their ability to grow, and we're here to be of service to those companies and work hand in hand to uh, build successful enterprises that are not only profitable, but also uh, provide economic and social benefits through uh, the act of uh, what they do. Um, another important piece is we recently formed an alliance with a uh, incredible collection of uh, rocket scientists, if you will, uh, from the World Sustainability Foundation, which is also based in uh, Colorado. World Sustainability uh, Foundation uh, works to create public-private uh, partnerships to um, foster uh, uh, the ability to address important uh, impacts from climate change. And whatnot, and we recently uh, formed a uh, partnership to actually work together on a project basis to uh, do uh, important work in uh, addressing uh, uh, climate change problems that are associated with um, uh, on a global basis, actually. And we recently uh, uh, jointly prepared and submitted to uh, a uh, proposal relating to. Uh, creating roadmaps for green cities throughout uh, Europe, uh, the Far East and uh, Middle East. And we're very excited about working together with this very talented group of scientists, uh, principally from NASA, as it turns out, who over the years have been able to observe the impact of climate change from, uh, from the skies. And uh, seeing that visibly uh, was something that moved them to devote uh, time and energy to the World Sustainability Foundation. So we have a true uh, profit, not-for-profit not partnership uh, to create impact. And uh, we're very excited about uh, where that is. So uh, without further ado, I'll uh, pass the baton back. Yeah, thank you, Ed. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it showed, it showed uh, 
I'll, I'll let you go, Meg, but I, it showed our spurt ability. We talked to uh, Mr. Kellogg about some of his lexicon and different uh, words that he's invented over time, and, and spurt ability is uh, one of them. And Jim, from our side, had to do, uh, create some tremendous spurt ability along with uh, Zahir, who I think just joined to get the RFP in on time on Monday. So back to you, Meg. Sorry about that. Thank you. No, that was fine. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Ed. That was Ed uh, Tepper. He's our Chief Operating Officer based out of New Jersey. I want to give um, an introduction real quick to our Chief Financial Officer, Hanan Levine. He's just going to give a quick uh, update on our um, a couple of our subsidiaries. So go for it, Hanan. Yeah, thanks, everybody. And thanks, Meg. And, and it's uh, great to see Mr. Kellogg here. Excited to, to see what he has to say. Uh, I think um, really quickly to touch about the creativity as well, which is kind of the main topic of this. Uh, the uh, World Sustainable Organization, um, our cooperation with them, the um, for-profit, non-for-profit cooperation really is kind of at the forefront of that uh, creativity that the impact world needs. Uh, as we've seen, the impact world cannot be sustained. We can't move forward. We can't create change without that change has financial, true financial sustainability and backing. So we have to continue and grow and find creative ways to make the change sustainable from a financial, it makes sense from a financial situation. And that's what we do here in Kopi. So I thought that was a great, this is going to be a great example. I'm excited to see where it goes of this combination of not completely changing, not going away from philanthropy or not going only to ESG or only to impact investing, but really creating a, a kind of dynamic experience between the two and finding the places where they both fit. So just wanted to, to add to that a little bit. Additionally, we have uh, two of our investments. Um, again, going back to, to the creativity, you know, uh, Kopi's from its inception was looking at uh, companies that didn't just answer a specific need, but really found a new way to look at the world uh, without sounding too grandiose, founding solutions to problems that most people thought were too big to handle. The first of it is Uncharted Power that often deals with that deals with infrastructure, both from an energy and data perspective. As we're all here sitting on the Zoom instead of in a room together, and I like to say it every time. My, my daughter's in the next room going to school on Zoom. My wife's going to a meeting, and without fail, somebody gets kicked off. I think we've really come uh, to know that our infrastructure is lacking, and Uncharted Power is one of those companies that will help us move forward with that infrastructure. So we're excited to support them and and uh, that team. And lastly, IAC as well, uh, moving forward with uh, testing uh, the solution of plasma gasification for hazardous waste. Again, waste is not going anywhere. We need to find ways to treat it. Um, zero waste world is a great idea, but we can't ignore the waste that we currently have, the hazardous waste that is there that we need to treat with it. We're, exciting, we're excited about the uh, steps that ASD is taking forward, uh, forward actually uh, treating for the first time uh, bromine away successfully and proving in, in the real world in the test scenario that is treatable. And now we're going to move forward uh, with them to support them to build the plant in Israel. So that's my quick intro for that. Good. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Hanan. Thanks, Hanan. All right, I'm going to pass it over to you, Craig, and uh, let you introduce Clark, and the two of you can have a conversation. And if any, once again, if anyone has questions, feel free to put them in the chat directly to me. And after um, our conversation will be sure to address those. So thank you. Yeah, well, I appreciate Clark's uh, patience before we got to talk. If we had Dick Vitale here, he'd be going kind of like, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't wait to jump in. Um, interestingly, uh, our Uncharted Power uh, investment, which is uh, you know special investment for us uh, on the infrastructure side, was, was brought to us by our, our basketball and our NBA connections. And and Magic Johnson actually is a Michigan State grad. I, I proved that I could say this for Evan mm -hmm. Ohio State uh, Clark here, but uh, he's on their on their board, and and we're excited about the connections between uh, sport and some of the other things we're going to going to do, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, we're excited to have Clark here today. He is a special person. Um, he is a a former player, played uh, collegially, played in the NBA, uh, is a well-known commentator on CBS, uh, especially for uh, college basketball. He is the voice of NBA 2K. So when we when we talked about having uh, Mr. Kellogg here as our special guest today, uh, some of our younger people knew him best from the 2K mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
uh, games, and he's a father, and uh, 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 you know, is, is uh, I think something that's important to to our family and to Clark's uh, Clark's kind of uh, uh, worldview is the his perspective as a as a family person. So so I I I'm going to uh, have Clark tell a little bit more about his background, and I got a couple questions for him. Then we're going to go back to do some co-piece uh, more detail. And then we're going to open it up for everybody. So over to you, Mr. Mr. Kellogg. Thanks for being hey, here. Hey, Craig and, and Meg and the rest of the co-piece team, thank you for having me. Great to see everybody and um, appreciate those of you who the, that have joined us um, today um, being on. Uh, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes. First, let me say how excited I am to learn and to grow and to learn more about co-piece and the mission and the work and the capacity and desire to do good in multiple ways. Um, we do good by being good. We do good by associating and partnering with other people that are interested in doing good. And when you think about um, our capacity for good, particularly as we amplify that in a team environment is really powerful. And I come from that background as a former college and NBA player even in my work currently as a broadcaster, be it with CBS, um, have been there full time since 1997 in the role of lead studio or lead game analyst. And for the last 11 years, have been part of the NBA 2K franchise as one of the commentators um, there. And all of it is team related. I mean, there's not anything we do to the maximum and to the best of our ability to do good without other folks involved. So I come from a teamwork perspective and a teamwork background and it's been sports I mean from the time I was eight or nine years old that's what galvanized me that's what captured my heart and my attention was was hoops and I've been fortunate enough by God's grace to um, enjoy a tremendous journey in the game um, first as a player and then now um, closing in on 30 years as a commentator um, played for the Ohio State University from 1980 to 82. Um, left after my third year to pursue my dream of being a pro basketball player. Got drafted by the Indiana Pacers and um, had a promising playing career with the Pacers cut short after just five years because of knee injury. I wore away cartilage in my left knee, three arthroscopies, three knee surgeries, and ultimately at the age of 26, um, my basketball playing career was over. Um, my knee could not withstand the rigors of playing NBA basketball. And so I didn't know exactly what I would do, but transitioned into broadcasting. Basketball is what I had known um, best and what I had done most. And to have a chance to continue in that lane was a real blessing for me. I was a marketing major in college at Ohio State, ultimately went back and got my degree in marketing in 1996. I tell everybody I was on the 17 year plan to get my undergraduate degree. I started there in the fall of 79, uh, detoured to the NBA in 82, got married in 83. Uh, our three children were born in 87, 89, 91, a girl and two boys. And I was chipping away at those hours I needed between 82 and 97 to get my marketing degree, 96, and thankful that I did. And I've been in the world of broadcasting, spent time at ESPN, did my first broadcasting work with the Indiana Pacers um, back in 1987 upon retiring from the team and the league. Um, got my start in radio with the Indiana Pacers. Um, Cleveland State University was my first opportunity in television that same fall. And from there, we just slowly but surely um, sought to hone our craft, um, solicit counsel and coaching from other folks in that world, and have now been at it for, for 30 plus years. So really grateful to um, be doing what I do and excited about uh, what Co-Peace represents and really eager to learn even more about the combination of um, investing for good and ultimately being able to have a lasting impact in areas of people's lives that will far outlive us, quite honestly. And anytime you can, to me, couple um, doing good and amplifying that for the greater good is really um, a winning um, combination. So that's a little bit of where I sit and where my heart and head is currently. So Craig, I'll turn it back to you and 
Um, let's have a little conversation before we dig into some more of um, the Cold Peace world. Well, thank you very much, uh, Clark. I, I, I'm used to you uh, facilitating the uh, these conversations, so, <laughs> so I, hopefully I learned a few things uh, being in the. In I'm the, sure you the have. Man. So I'm sure you have. The uh, tell us a little more about the the injury. I also played college basketball and, and was injured, and uh, and I think you know I thought I'd play longer than I did, um, and uh, I think the my knees kind of created my life in a lot of ways it, it mm. made me zigzag I you know I I lived in India growing up a little bit and tried to reflect on where I'd been and some some of those adventures and where I was going to go from there uh so t tell us a little more about how how dramatic that change yeah. of your of your life station was by uh, yeah. with your injury yeah you know it was a pretty significant transition I was fortunate mm -hmm. when I was 16 years old I met a mentor a guy who was in the insurance insurance business very successful insurance agent and still a dear friend to this day in Cleveland Ira Novak and he exposed me to the reality of the world of business and what that mm -hmm. looked like and what that might mean if I pursued it at a young age so I always thought about basketball as a means to the end as an end, means to an end but I wasn't anticipating being done at 26 after mm -hmm. starting my MBA, MBA career at 21, I anticipated playing for 8, 10, 12 years as mm -hmm. opposed to just five. So when that happened, it was disappointing and sad and abrupt. Um, but because I had um, a pretty good foundation financially from my years in the league, I had people in my life that could nurture and guide and direct me. Um, I had faith in God through Christ that my future mm -hmm. was in his hands. So I was disappointed. But I approached it as though a chapter was ending and a new one was beginning. And mm -hmm. therefore, I stepped into this new chapter. Didn't know what it would be until the fall of 87. But once it became broadcasting, I started to pursue it with the same zeal that I played with um, and wanted to be good and wanted to excel and wanted to have a good, productive career. And um, lo and behold, here we are, thanks to a lot of people, uh, my own diligence and um, but also good fortune. I mean, I've been great, tremendously blessed. But that's how I handled it, Craig. My faith was mm -hmm. really the anchor. My faith mm -hmm. in God, realizing there's always a bigger picture and a greater plan um, when your life belongs to God. And I had really done something I had dreamed of doing. I mm -hmm. was grateful for the opportunity I got to play. And when it ended, prematurely, I was disappointed, heartbroken, but that was relatively temporary. And then once I got moving towards the broadcasting it fit me and um i went after it with um, vigor and zeal yeah thank thank you for sharing that the so, uh tell us a little more about the, we've been talking about the importance of team uh yeah. several of us have uh gone through some uh, entrepreneur entrepreneurial adventures and when we look back at it it's it's all about the team and when you've when you've made that transition into the broadcast booth um it feels like it'd be less of a team from the outside, but but tell us how how you know the supporting team and all the different team members are important uh, in that. Oh in that wow, world. man! I appreciate you bringing that up because people that do follow sports and watch mm -hmm. and listen um, tend to focus on those they see and hear, which is understandable. And I'm in that role, but clearly there are countless people behind us that make it all happen, and we're a team. I'm representing yeah. that team when people are listening to me and watching me. I'm always representing the CBS team. And it's important for me and I think for all of us to recognize the value of team and how we can add to our teams and how we need to uplift and appreciate the others on our teams, whatever roles they have. And sports helps you develop that type of paradigm and, and worldview when you've played, even if you haven't played at the highest level, when you've been part of groups or organizations or workplaces and you realize your role is important but there are other people that are there as well that teamwork is key and it's an attitude and a mindset it's not mm -hmm. just checking off certain things and on, on a list i mean that's part of it but that's not the real catalyst or driver mm -hmm. or sustaining element of it the sustaining element of teams is one recognizing that you need other people you nice. you need them to be your best and you hopefully can bring the best of you to enhance them. And then when you amplify that, that's when you really magnify your capacity for doing great work. I know Jim was the one 
with the spurt ability you acknowledge, but I know it wasn't just him. Yeah. I mean, we're up against that timeline to get that yeah. RFP um, mm -hmm. laid out. I mean, there were a number of folks that had yeah. a hand in that. So, um, and then just really valuing and appreciating, appreciating your team members on a daily basis. You know, one of the things that I've done over my years, um, going back to really late in high school and, and, and college even, is uh, because of the visibility I gained as a really accomplished basketball player, and sports is so esteemed in our culture and in our world that you tend to get placed on a pedestal when you excel in a sport or in business or in mm -hmm. any other endeavor that is, is deemed glamorous. And so people would always know my name if they followed college or pro basketball or would have heard my name possibly, not always, but – and I found it to be discomforting that I would meet so many people and oftentimes wouldn't be able to call them by name. So I really developed a, an intentionality around seeking to remember people's names. No matter how often or how little I met them, I wanted to call everybody I encountered with by name if I was in any kind of um, extended interaction with them. Yeah. And it's a small thing, but it's a big thing. It's mm -hmm. a really big thing. And I found it to be valuable. And I don't do it because it's valuable. It's the right thing. I mean, people mm -hmm. want, it's another way of extending appreciation and gratitude and mm -hmm. care to other people. And um, for those listening, I mean, again, I know many people will tell me, hey, you do a good job with names. I, I'm terrible with them, but we can all be better. <laughs> you know, we can, I mean, I'm intentional about it. I'm actually, yeah, my, yeah. Wife will tell you, my wife will tell you I'm fanatical and maniacal yep. about it yeah but i think it's um, one of those ways that you can can show care and um yeah and be caring i, I completely agree i remember uh working the uh clem haskins basketball camp a few years ago and uh -huh. and i and one of our big emphasis were was to learn all the campers names that you know that we could and it was i'm not good at it either it was it was yeah, an effort, but, but yeah. at the end when the parents, you know, you're talking to the parents and you're, you know, calling her by, by name, I think it was, I think it was an intentional, uh, and, and a recognition of value, um, that, yeah. uh, yeah, I appreciate that. that. So my last question for you before we do a quick zoom, zoom through our, uh, our, uh, information is that, so on coming back to the creativity bent, I've always been attracted to your, you know, compendium of, uh, of, uh, <laughs> of words and phrases that you've created for to help explain uh, the game of basketball in a way that everybody could understand. Uh, my favorite one before I, is, is uh, take the first available parking spot at the mall. And I, I've used that so many times where, you know, instead of people kind of going around and around, uh, yeah. just, you know, if there's something open, take it as I, it works in sport, but it also works in business and yeah. in impact investing. There's a lot of driving around and around the mall. And nobody wants to get that parking spot because they don't want to make any mistakes. So coming from the world of sport, we, we like to get things done. So we, we're, 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 even if that parking spot isn't perfect, we're okay taking it and then, mm -hmm. you know, making our walk to where we got to go to the store. Yeah. And, and we're, we've been applying that. So, so you've had influence on, on Coke's oh, wow. life more than you even cool. know. <laughs> but yeah, so, so tell us a little bit about how you develop your vernacular and, and maybe, you know, some of the different words you've got. Yeah, you know, when I first got into broadcasting, one of the things is I sought advice on, on how to become good at it. A number of my colleagues emphasized you needed to be yourself, but to be unique. And I've mm -hmm. always loved words. I've always enjoyed English and reading and writing and communicating. So it was natural for me to use words as part of my uniqueness and to come up with different ways to bridge the gap between basketball jargon and the common or casual fan and to be able to use everyday situations that people encounter whether they're sports minded or not to tell a sports story or to create an analogy in the game and mm -hmm. so I'm constantly looking at words when I'm reading if something strikes me as unique and has a certain flavor and could be applied to a basketball analogy um, I've got an iPad full of new words <laughs> How many, how many do you have? I, I can't even tell you because I add to the list all the time. There's a couple hundred at least. And not all of them, not all of them get used. I mm -hmm. typically write them down and try to think about when they might be appropriate. But um, I tell folks it's better to sprinkle 
as opposed to spray. So I have a full arsenal and I try to pick times and words that may fit or um, everyday occurrences. And food is one of my, 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 my crutch analogies I, because everybody eats and can mm -hmm. experience and appreciate food. And then day-to-day -day circumstances that, that we all encounter no matter where we are. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, if, if uh, yeah, w as they become more familiar with our team, we'll start sprinkling them in our, there you in go. our world there as you well. Go. Uh, well, appreciate that, Clark. And, and if, uh, as Meg mentioned earlier, uh, if you have any questions, uh, post them in the chat to Meg directly, and we'll get back to that here in a little bit. We're going to go through, we're just going to go very quickly through a, um, a uh, short deck that we have um, prepared for today. Um, as, as Ed uh, suggested, you know, Copeace is seeking to create inclusive, socially justice wealth for all people. So we've got a, um, uh, we, we think that we're in, uh, our timing is good, uh, which sounds, you know, a little optimistic in today's world, but I think that we're stop stubbornly optimistic about where, we're, where things are going. Um, and impact investing in and ESG investing, you may have heard a little bit about this, is definitely uh, uh, changing the game a bit. So, so it, you know, historically, um, there was some socially inve in, uh, responsible investing that was being done. Uh, my parents, for example, were participating in mutual funds and, and you know, not really understanding you know, the return uh, part of it. So, so I think impact investing is different where, where the return helps uh, grow the sustainability. Um, and uh, it gives it a lot more long-term future. There's quite a bit of data going on right now on ESG, which is uh, another kind of term that we use here in the impact world that have been, has been growing. So young people and women and people who care about the future are really uh, promoting this idea that, you know, using your money to do good things is, is important. It ends up being a good business decision to care about the long-term future of our world. And we're seeing more and more data supporting this. So, so we're, we're excited about where that's going. One of my favorite stories on the impact investing side is, and not really knowing what's happening in your portfolio is, uh, is uh, I was watching a, a, a documentary by Kamal Bell on for-profit prisons. And, and he was talking about, you know, that people, you know, the people are supporting this without even knowing it. And somebody during the documentary said, hey, Kamal, you should check your portfolio. And he said, no, I'm not investing in any of this stuff. Then he came back and he and he opened his uh, his uh, portfolio with his uh, uh, financial advisor, and she said, "You see this mutual fund? You see this thing you've got? It's got 20% uh, for-profit prisons, 10% oil and gas, and some other things." So, I think people just didn't have knowledge of of uh, what was going on, and and with the current state of the world, there's much more available information. So, so as that's happening, people are much more intentional about where they're putting their money in. And we're seeing that uh, continue to grow. Next one, Jim. So our, our idea is to um, um, directly invest in things that are, are doing good things for the world and giving us a strong return. I think when we talk a little about um, you know, doing good things for the world, a lot of times people think about philanthropy and there's certainly a very good role for that. Uh, but we, we're seeing a little bit of fatigue in that space and people are wanting to have a little more sustainability. We're talking to a foundation, for example, that has been tired of the, their approach of giving money and giving money and not getting any sustainability be, uh, for it. So it, this one's particularly in the sport world and they've had um, experiences, you know, given a decent amount of money to somebody to build a soccer pitch, for example. And then two years later, either it was, it was sold or it's under disrepair. So our idea is to try to create a system where, where we kind of um, modernize the holding company model that Berkshire Hathaway put together and create you know, real returns to these holdings. So, so instead of uh, a philanthropic approach, we are seeking a return, but we also think that provides a much more of a, of a sustainable path. So we, we say internally, if it doesn't have a margin, it can't have a full mission. Uh, go ahead, Jim. So we are, uh, we're using the, um, what we're calling internally the head plus the heart plus the math approach. And we think that uh, uh, the, you know, we can, we can 
create a long-term impact through our, our investments. Um, we are, with our holding company model, we are, are seeking controlling interest in a lot of our holdings so that we can use our team. As we talk about our team, we've got an extended bench of, of very qualified professionals that can, can give us um, uh, more capabilities than we have internally. So we've been able to continue to build that, which we, we like a lot. And then we're seeing out there, as Ed kind of mentioned, that people are looking for uh, the ability to fill the gaps. So I think Copiece is, is a company that can come in and, and be helpful in, in, that, in that space. We're, the next thing we're going to do is uh, is open up our – that was very fast. So if you've got questions on that, that's fine. I see you, Evan, with your Ohio State, your Ohio State jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we're going to put, we're going to, what we've got, you know, our vehicle right now to democratize access to the game is a crowdfunding campaign we've got going in WeFunder. We know that uh, some of you have been uh, participating and following along there. So wanted to kind of open that up and let Jim give you a very quick tour through the WeFunder platform. Go ahead, Jim. Sure. Thanks, Craig. Yeah. So this is WeFunder, which um, it can probably be compared to Kickstarter. If you're familiar with that, it's a similar sort of thing where you can go and look at potential companies to. And the nice thing about the way we're doing it, this is the minimum investment is $360. So it's meant to be like very accessible to the everyday person, even if they aren't heavy into investing in any way. And the way that it's set up is meant to provide all the information in one place. And it's where we're continuing to have our conversations. So again, if you're looking for more information, more resources about impact investing and like learning what we're doing and how it's working, uh, this is the place to come. What's great is that uh, it has like basically a profile page of all the different materials that we have. It, uh, you know, talks about why other people have invested in us. You can even ask a question on behalf of uh, that. And as I said, it's where we're posting um, videos and information uh, resources that allow us to uh, you know, provide educational opportunities to people, you know, as much as this is a financial and investment driven uh, opportunity for us, it's also an educational piece. And again, the equality piece is a big thing for us that this is something that is accessible to everybody and people feel like, uh, you know, they have an understanding around what we're doing with their money and that it's not just some weird, you know, black box that you throw your money into and it comes back out later. That's not what we want. We want it to be um, very, thought led so people can be involved in the process and really as Clark has said become a part of our team that's ultimately what we're driving mm -hmm. so um, yes I encourage you if you're interested in just learning more about impact investing in general um, or specifically about copies it's a great place to come it also has all of our news that we've been mentioned in we've had we have an awesome PR firm that has helped us succeed in uh, reaching people in the spaces that they already are which is cool so feel free to do that um, and yeah, and then if you ultimately decide that it's something you're interested in, it's, it's right there, the big old invest button. So again, that's meant more as an, as an educational resource and a place you can go for all of this information. Um, but it's also where you can follow through if you're interested in using um, some, some amount of money to improve the world in this way. So with that, again, also very quick, I'll throw it back to Craig. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, so so one of the things we wanted to tease out a little bit here today is that we are going to be announcing a new subsidiary uh, very soon, um, uh, later today, actually, um, where we're, we're, it's going to be, we're going to call it Copy Sport uh, and COSPO for short to fill in the COMA and the COFI kind of vernacular that we have internally. And our idea is to take um, some of these companies that are doing good things for the world. We've uh, had some excellent conversations with uh, several different entities. One is a uh, modest clothing company. It, it ends up that a lot of young Muslim women stop playing sport at you know 11 or 12 years old because uh, if uh, if they're required to wear a job, they don't want to be not cool and and they just so they just stop wearing wearing playing sports. So we've got a couple uh, that are very. Um, Kind of in line with us, there's there's a, a couple others that are more in the philanthropic nonprofit world that we think, and they're interested in them talking to us about becoming a for-profit entity so that they could have more sustainable influence uh, long term. So Kopi Sport will be coming your way here very soon. Um, it seems appropriate to be talking about that today. I'm going to send it back to Meg and we can open up for questions. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, we have some good questions coming in. Very thoughtful and 
um, I'm excited to get to them. So I'm going to hope to get to all of them in the time that we have. First question is for Clark. What mentor had the most influence on your life? And what advice did he, um, were you, have you been given that you still practice faithfully today? Well, my dad and mom were my main mentors, obviously. They're both, they're both deceased now. But outside of that, um, I mentioned um, Ira Novak, a very successful insurance agent, um, independent insurance agent in northeastern Ohio, where I grew up, um, befriended me when I was in high school. I worked in his agency during the summers. And the biggest education I got was seeing what a real live business, successful business looks like and how insurance perhaps could have been a career path for me taking advantage of um, no name visibility and notoriety in addition to, to learning what that business was about, which is really relationships. And most things come down to relationships. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm on this call and connected to Cold Peace because of my history with Craig. We go back in the world of basketball several, probably decades now when we cross paths with Final Fours yeah. and the like. And so when he reached out and I saw what he was doing and it lined up with my heartbeat and values, but the biggest thing, relationships. And um, mm -hmm. he also reinforced my intentionality around um, calling people by name because mm -hmm. it was something he struggled with a bit. And I still practice that to this day, um, seeking to address folks um, by their name after I've met them. Very good. Thanks, Clark. Here's mm -hmm. another one for you. After seeing athletes and the likes of Magic and Chris Paul get involved in the impact investing space, yeah. do you see sports being a bridge to underprivileged areas and young people to care and educate themselves more about the world and their future and their wealth? No doubt, unequivocally, yes, yes, and yes, in part because sport has such a far-reaching um, capacity um, locally, domestically, internationally, I mean, sport is a, and much like music, sport, entertainment, those things connect us all, no matter what our differences mm -hmm. might be. And in this climate of divisiveness and challenge and COVID-19 and the like, um, I think there's just a heightened ampl amplification of seeking to, for all of us, and I know I'm challenging myself, how can I be better and do better with more intentionality in areas that need help, mm -hmm. people that need real help? How can we do our part as individuals, as a family. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's part of what Code Peace's mission is about too, on um, finding ways to connect good people and doing good for sustainable good. And mm -hmm. I, I believe um, it's amazing this generation of not only athletes, but just the um, millennials and Gen Xers and Zers. I mean, there's a real desire to reach beyond themselves, I think, to, to impact others. Mm -hmm. And that gives great momentum to to us coming together to do that kind of work. So clearly athletes can always have a um, huge role in that because of the visibility they're afforded and the resources they're afforded when they've gotten to the highest levels of play because of the, the, um, the um, financial resources they have at their disposal. And, the, and there's, there's some pretty good returns coming from some of the investments. Chris Paul, oh, for I bet. example, oh, I, yeah. he, was, he was one of the first people in the Beyond Meat uh, investment. So I, I think it's a, you know, using your brand to kind of help elevate that brand is, is yeah. part of their va the yeah, value of Chris point. Paul coming in. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that, uh, he, he, you know, seeing where the world is going has been something that's been rewarding financially as well, which is yeah. good. I mean, good it's, point. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. This next question is kind of a combination question for Copies and for Clark. So, Craig, I'm going to start with you and then we'll pass mm -hmm. it on to Clark. Uh, regarding the point that you both made about the importance of a team, how would Copeace approach a possible holding that has a poor team environment? Would that be enough for Copeace to pass on the opportunity or would you try to remediate? And then Roger asked again, is, and for Mr. Kellogg, is it possible for players to change an organization? Wow, that's a that's, I know. Uh, that's, Those a, are good, that's right? a good one. I know. Really that's good. a good one. I would, I, from, from the Copeace perspective, you know, especially early while we're trying to make sure we develop our track record, it, it's it, it feels like we're I mean we're trying to find strong management teams that we believe in and we can put behind um, uh, if we see a team that we don't think is strong I would think that would be a pretty strong red flag uh, uh, right away for us we've looked at about 150 um, uh, candidates for holdings so far portfolio holdings um, and 
it, 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 that would probably be a non-starter for us. I mean, if it, if it had some tremendous impact that we saw and, and a way for us to kind of bring our team to, to uh, facilitate the you know, appropriate change, possibly, but it would, it would have to be, it's a case by case basis, but I'd say generally no. Yeah. I'll pass it over to you, Mr. Kellogg. Yeah, and I'm thinking this question is around the players being able to galvanize and maybe influence ownership or programs around mm -hmm. some of their social justice issues mm -hmm. that are top of mind, much like we've seen in the NBA bubble with the shutdown of, I'm assuming, I'm just, I hope I've gotten mm -hmm. the context of the question. I think you got right. it. Yeah. yeah, and I think players certainly, we all have an opportunity when we gather together and are committed to trying to bring about justice or righteousness in areas where it lacks, um, whatever influence we have, and players have tremendous influence, even at the collegiate level, although it's not the pros and they don't have the financial resources, they do have the, uh, the, the influence because of what they're providing for those institutions in their respective sports. And when it's a collected, informed, committed effort to try to bring leverage to change, some of that friction and agitation can produce good results. Uh, and I think clearly yes is the answer. They have that opportunity to do so, um, athletes in general, men and women. And we've seen examples of it even more mm -hmm. so um, in this day and age of um, athletes coming together um, for greater causes. Excellent. I'll lighten things up a little bit. Leave it to one of our esteemed board directors for this one. Your Wikipedia page says you lost a game of horse to President Obama. <laughs> <laughs> the, the question is, did you let him win? That was <laughs> oh, man. Well, I would actually nice. direct you to the video. President Obama has made that one of um, one of his highlights over his time in, in, in the White House, um, knocking me off in that competitive game of POTUS, we called it. Um, in, in deference to the president of the United States, horse, whatever you want to call it. But anyway, yes, I lost. I gave him an opportunity to get back into the game after I had gotten a big lead. And when I did that, my assumption was I'd still be able to come out on top. Obviously, it didn't work out that way. I'm okay with it. I didn't like it, but I'm okay with it. I can be a gracious loser. But some of my peers are still terribly disappointed in me that I let <laughs> I let that victory get away so it was I didn't let him I let him back in and then he took full advantage of the opportunity and momentum shift to get a um, to get a highlight moment which actually is a highlight moment for both of us I think he beat me and I got a chance to interact with our president um, because of the game of basketball mm -hmm. yeah. very good thank you thanks Brad um, we touched on this a little bit, but I think uh, the guests want to dive into it a little more. Clark, sport has famously been a place where social equity has found allies and progress. What, if any, possibilities do you see for sport to influence environmental or other issues? I think there's still an opportunity, clearly. And again, it all mm -hmm. goes back to not just the social issues of the day, but the individual interests of those who are leveraging their influence or their brand and their visibility to various causes. So anytime you have folks of in influence, means, and commitment, then I think you actually, now, whether or not that shift, I think you're gonna see more athletes embrace um, the environmental issues and the climate changing that's taking place because it impacts all of us. Um, so I, I do believe that you'll begin to see uh, more of more of an effort by athletes um, to to shift in addition to the social justice mm -hmm. issues that, for, for particularly for many um, black male and female athletes, is a really police reform and mm -hmm. um, systemic racism. Those may be a little more on the front burner currently, but I eventually imagine that and anticipate that you'll see that spread out to environmental issues as well. Very good. I think we'll end. I have one more question. Actually, I have several more questions, but we will probably end with one more and then we'll revert back to those of you whose questions didn't get answered. And this is kind of, again, a little more of a tangential question, but there's um, inquiry about what you think about college athletes being paid. Mm -hmm. Just kind of a, what are your thoughts on that? I'm not for paying the college athletes. I'm 
always for continuing to enhance their experience and giving them more a piece of the corporate pie that's out there. Um, I do value a college degree and that exchange is still meaningful and valuable in my estimation. Is it all that scholarship athletes should be entitled to? I think there's room to enhance that. And I think there's also room to enhance the value of the education in developing student athletes for their lives after their sport. And by that, I mean work opportunities. Many scholarship athletes have very little opportunity to work during their off seasons in this day and age. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the case when I was in college. I spent every summer that I was in college actually working a job, getting mm -hmm. real life work experience. That doesn't happen nearly as much as it should in the business of college athletics now, particularly in the revenue generating sports, which we're talking um, football men's, on the men's football and basketball, men's side, basketball, volleyball, perhaps are the two biggest ones on the women's side in terms of revenue generation. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a two, there's a multi-pronged approach. Continue to enhance and increase the value of the education, not just from a monetary standpoint, but from a real meaningful standpoint, making sure kids are getting meaningful degrees and opportunities to enhance those degrees while they're in school. And then enhancing the package of what a scholarship student athlete gets financially so that there are no out-of-pocket expenses and there are opportunities for maybe even a little extra in the mm -hmm. kitty for full cost of attendance. I think those are solutions that, that, that appeal to me. Um, if you want to be paid, then being a pro is where you have to go. But there should be more enhancement to the full mm -hmm. package, and that includes financial and educational mm -hmm. value increase, increasement, increasing um, by yeah. the institutions and the NCAA. Thank you. I, actually, I, I lied. I have one more question because this is a good tag along question that's come in. Um, you mentioned the support that you had on your financial journey through your professional yeah. career. Um, how did you manage that journey to avoid the pitfalls that a lot of professional athletes cannot avoid after they leave the game? Well, mistakes are part of growth and we all have made them. I've made some, I wish I could recapture and take mulligans on a few of the investments I made, but I was, I think the real key is to be really committed and intentional about your own personal development in every area in terms of education, being informed, financial education, financial literacy, understanding the world you live in. And that's a, you need people to help you do that, but that's a personal responsibility call for all of us. I know some resources are limited and access and environments impact that, but there's a level of commitment that has to be made, particularly in the athletic space, by young athletes to realize the world is broader than the sport and they have a responsibility to themselves to be educated and informed and to be lifelong learners. We're all called to be lifelong learners. John Wooden said, we should learn like we're gonna live forever, but live like we might die tomorrow. So there's an urgency to every day, but there's also some preparation around education and learning that we have to engage ourselves in. So that's how I approached it. I always wanted mm -hmm. to be informed and learn and grow. I knew I would make mistakes, have good people around me, heed good counsel but continue to be educated so I could hopefully make more good decisions than bad. Excellent. Thank you. That's perfect. Craig, you want to wrap us up? Yeah. Thank, thank you, uh, Clark and, yeah. and Meg and yeah. everybody being here. That was extremely interesting. Uh, really appreciate your time. Mr. Kellogg, we were supposed to see each other at the final four this year. I know. And I know, it, the, 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 it's, uh, it feels like it was, uh, you know, time is not real right now, but um, no, right. uh, we're, look, right. yeah. we're, we're looking forward to the upcoming uh, college season. Kopi Sport mm -hmm. has actually been mm -hmm. invited to possibly be part of some bubble events that are coming. So we're, wow. we might right. be seeing you in there somewhere. Um, but, uh, and, and I know we went a little fast on, on some of the Kopi stuff. Mm -hmm. So let, let us know if you have any other questions and Jim will be posting this. Um, but uh, appreciate everybody being here and really appreciate your time. Clark, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Co Peace team and, and our audience. Um, really appreciate having the opportunity to share. Looking forward to the hoop season and journeying along with Co Peace. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Clark. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thank you. Have a